So part of why I started this project is because I was born in the Marshall Islands and um, I wanted to do something that had to do with teaching others about the Marshall Islands and what it is in the history bet between the relationship of the United States and the Marshall Islands because uh, I know that um, the Marshall Islands is a country that very few Americans are familiar with. Starting off with culture and tradition, so you know a little bit about Marshallese culture. Um, so walking by someone, if you hear, uh, here or in the Marshall Islands, if you hear the word Yagwe, it means hello, goodbye, or love, which um, also um, is what aloha means. So. Agricultural products include coconuts, bananas, breadfruit, and limes, pumpkins, and papayas. And fish, chicken, and pork are also a part of the diet, which are usually served during gemins, um, which is uh, the celebration of the baby's first birthday. It's breadfruit. I don't know what breadfruit is. It's okay. You don't have to explain it now. Continue. Um, so the Marshallese are descended from voyagers, storytellers, and fishermen. Land is an important resource in the Marshall Islands. And it provides food, links the people to their ancestors and maintains the culture. Um, so like um, society, like society, land before um, colonization was matrilineal, meaning that it was passed down from generation to generation through women. And in Marshallese culture, women and men were both equal. So basically there was no um, head of the household. Um, and a woman could be a chief, um, just like a man could. Um, so even though colonization is not directly linked to the introduction of radiation, which is what my project was about, um, it played a huge role in altering society and changing culture, and you'll see how the U.S. used colon the advantages of colonization to uh, gain control over the Marshall Islands. So the Marshall Islands was one of the last cultures to be colonized. Before it was taken over by the U.S., it was colonized by the Spanish, German, and Japanese. Um, as coloni colonization took over, it also took away most of the culture. And um, although most of the people who came, most of the missionaries that came were there to change the religion, convert the people, um, they also ended up exploiting natural resources. Um, and many um, Marshallese identify the German era as the um, um, a transfer between uh, family income and uh, to uh, just basically every man for himself. So, um, so from communal to mm -hmm. competitive. Mm -hmm. So um, um, when the, when the Japanese came uh, to uh, colonize the Marshall Islands, it wasn't exactly to. Um, convert the people is just used as a military base um, during World War II. Um, and the Marshallese people suffered greatly under Japanese control as starvation struck the island, mostly um, uh, affecting a lot of the atolls. And Marshallese were beaten, hanged, or beheaded for stealing food from their own trees. This is Bikini Atoll. Yeah. area, right? So have you guys seen the nuclear tests on the Bikini Atoll? You're going to get to this, right? Yeah. So this is where the U.S. essentially tested its atomic bombs on human beings. And um, this is where, like, when you see the blast in the ocean, like the, the old footage of the blast in the ocean, that's the Marshall Islands. And it, it, it snowed on the people, but it was radioactive fallout. Anyway. So... The, J the Japanese used island hopping or leapfrogging, um, which was a military strategy. Um, and basically, the advantages served greatly to the US because they wanted to sneak up on the Japanese and surround them. So they also took on the strategy. Um, so um, the Japanese took over many of the islands, and this included this other Pacific islands, not uh, just the Marshall Islands. But um, uh, they, 
the U.S. Um, control, uh, took control over islands that were not strongly defended by the Japanese and sort of made their way towards the Japanese and they ended up taking over um, Iwo Jima and um, soon after that Okinawa. And the U.S. was concerned about time, money, and casualties, so they, um, to end things, they forced the Japanese to uh, surrender using the first atomic bomb. The United States um, had competition with the Soviet Union with in nuclear weapons development, and uh, basically the, fir the only test that was ever conducted was the Trinity bomb in New Mexico, which was for uh, testing for the Japanese bombs in World War II. And it uh, ended up um, exposing many U.S. civilians to that radiation. So basically to look, um, to um, prevent any risk of exposure, the um, U.S. was looking for a good testing site that was far away. And the Marshall, Marshall Islands was the best candidate because it was both far away and very isolated. Um, so basically, the United States told the people that they were the chosen people. Um, they were making a sacrifice to God, and they were to benefit all humankind. So this is the, how colonization has um, played a huge role in how the U.S. gained control, because they used the name of God to um, to convince the Marshallese people that they were doing this to help um, that they uh, to help the United States. Uh, the Marshallese wanted to honor requests made by the Americans who liberated them from the Japanese. And so um, other things that the United States said um, was, God will thank you, and it's for the good of mankind. And the U.S. took advantage of their appreciation. Um, another method that the U.S. used to gain control was, to, was using uh, exploiting the usefulness of anthropologists. And anthropologists study human behavior, and some anthropologists that do work in uh, studying cultures, um, they're generally supposed to um, preserve the culture and inform others about it, but by participating and um, making this testing possible, they're also risking the possibility of uh, totally destroying an entire culture. So, um, the reason why many people don't really know much about the Marshall Islands is because none, no information about uh, the nuclear testing, including which basically includes the path of fallout clouds, yields, and um, how much radiation, how much, how many people can be exposed to radiation, um, until recently was released to the public. And some tests were so powerful that they vaporized some islands right off the map. Is that right? disappear. Yeah. And from 1946 to 1958, the U.S. conducted 67 bombs in the Marshall Islands. And the Marshallese were not warned about the dangers of fallout, and they were not given any safety precautions should they experience any fallout. And they were not warned about the harm it could do to their country as a whole. So. Um, basically, Everybody knows one Marshallese world, world, which is Bikini, and Bikini is an atoll that is completely uninhabitable. And, and during and on March 1st, 1946, Bikinians were evacuated to basically maybe never return to their island, and um, so that the U.S. could um, conduct the largest nuclear nuclear weapon they ever tested, which was the Bravo hydrogen bomb. And oh, at 50 megatons, it vaporized three islands, and it was 1,000 times the magnitude of Hiroshima of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. 20 out of the 23 bombs that were tested on Bikini, Bikini Island were hydrogen bombs, and it, this really devastated the people because they cannot return. And this year marks the 71 years they've lived in exile. Can't return. Yeah. And were they ever compensated? Uh, I'll get to that. Okay. You're at 10 minutes, but almost. Uh, Sorry, keep going. <laughs> so the Bikini Swimsuit, uh, 
this is a reference to Bikini Island. So it came out on July 5th, 1946, and the fashion designer was inspired by the nuclear and hydrogen bomb because like a nuclear bomb, it's, it was split like the atoms when it's detonated, and he thought it would have an explosive reaction on men. Um, and it's very weird because it's very inappropriate in Marshallese modern society, and until the first missionaries came, women actually wore topless, and women still and do not uh, view breasts as a sexual object, which the bikini swimsuit does emphasize. They were sh shamed by the colonists. Yeah. And another reference is SpongeBob, and basically a lot of people think it's a fan theory, and I've been searching on the website, to, on every website to make sure that it wasn't a fan theory, because it doesn't sound like a fa fan theory at all and Nickelodeon themselves approved of it, and basically uh, they said, dwelling a few fathoms beneath the tropical island of Bikini Atoll in the subsurface city of Bikini Bottom, SpongeBob lives in a two-story pineapple. And basically, SpongeBob is a mutated world, and a lot of babies suffered from deformities that sometimes made their, this is an example, made their heads bigger than what they should be, and made it look like they look very similar to a lot of the SpongeBob characters, and those babies were called jelly babies. And basically, SpongeBob is uh, basically making these char mutated char characters funny, but who has the privilege to laugh at mutated um, things, which is basically what Marshall's babies had to suffer. So, Project 4.1 um, is the name of a um, medical study. So the U.S. held a series of tests which tested the, um, the effect of the radiation on people. Um, and in Rockville, Maryland, they created a haunted house called Project 4.1. And I was on the web, on a website that basically was looking for, um, I was basically looking for, uh, any information on the haunted house because I heard of it, but I didn't know what, like, if it was actually based on it, and on this um, website that was uh, promoting, um, adver uh, that was adver advertising trips that were worth going on, it said, looking for gory Halloween fun, inspired by a U.S. government medical study, the Warehouse 4.1 opens Friday, September 28th. Built as an urban haunted house, Project 4.1 is constructed to resemble a medical lab gone wrong, filled with zombies, dead bodies, and vicious military men. Actors play residents of the Marshall Islands who are exposed oh. to radioactive fallout in the 1954 Castle Grotto accident and may have suffered long-term harm. And obviously, this that was on the advertisement. Mm -hmm. So that's like that's like uh, I mean that's just basically totally dehumanizing yeah. much of these people. And also, the, okay, this angers me a lot, obviously, because haunted houses are for entertainment, and this was not a fun thing that the Marshallese had to endure. And um, and they were not given any treatment that could help them get better. They were just basically treated as lab rats. And second of all, like, may have suffered long-term harm. They actually did suffer long-term harm. Of course they did. <laughs> and turning this into a haunted house takes away their horrific aspect of it and makes it cool. Um, so the Runa Dome, basically, the U.S. did not want to clean up the mess, so they vacuumed all the nuclear waste into one dome and turned it um, and put it on an island, which is now called Runet Island. Well, it was called Runet Island before, I think. But they turned the island into a nuclear waste facility. Then Runet Dome is located on Runet Island, which is one of the 40 islands of the Nuitak Atoll. And this is where climate change plays a big part of it because a lot of scientists and nuclear acti uh, environmental activists say that storm is um, a strong storm may shatter it, and even if that doesn't happen, rising so sea levels may cause it to leak, and it would leak about 11,000 cubic yards. I of mean, if this degrees. floods, the if this floods, the radioactive material that's buried in this thing is just going to come right out. Yeah. So, and on nowhere on the beaches or on the island does it have a sign or warning to stay away, and basically. A, a lot of locals are 
obviously very upset about this because it has a stream of regular visitors from different islands coming to its abundant fishing grounds and uh, or to look for scrap metal for the salvage. And one local said, we asked the Americans, are you going to put a sign on the dome that says, don't come here because you might get exposed? Our president asked, are you going to put a sign up so that birds and turtles also understand? Um, the US has never formally apologized to the Marshall Islands for turning it into a drug test ground. I mean, how can you actually just uh, apologize for that? And they're still yet to pay for compensation of destroying many islands. Um, the government, so the 177 agreement is a signed agreement providing remedies to associated damage and damages and injuries, basically saying that it would pay for any damages and stuff, um, and help with medical stuff. And basically the US had complete control over all scientific and medical information, so they had the power to define which atolls were affected or not. And before test, oh, wait, actually, and um, basically the US narrowed down the number of atolls that were affected to four, originally, uh, and the U.S. government effectively limited responsibilities for cleanup and medical problems. So we, they basically said there were only four islands that were actually affected, so we don't have to pay for anybody else's radioactive yeah. treatment. Yeah, so three out of the 40 islands were cleaned up, cleaned up, and all but one were actually affected by radiation. Oh, okay. And before testing, it was part of the procedure to test the weather. Uh, so, um, and basically, um, and potential radiological hazard that could result from tests. And recently, from recently declassified documents, it demonstrates that some researchers predicted that winds would push Bravo's radioactive fallout towards inhabited atolls near Bikini Atoll. And it also showed that the military ignored these warnings and went on with the testing anyways. And uh, one of the, um, the commander of the military team responsible for carrying out the testing program received one of the reports and proposed to treat it like any other, my other, other member of my staff. When I do not agree with him, in short, we will kill it and stick it in a file. So the dude just decided he didn't like the information on the... Yeah. So um, I'm going to read basically a piece from a survivor who shares her experience in her own words about what happened um, when the bomb was detonated. I was living with my parents and some other family members on an island across the reef from the main island where we had gone to make Cobra. On that March morning, my father woke me while it was still pitch dark to cross the reef with some of my friends to the main island to buy some coffee, flour, and sugar. There were four of us, three girls and a boy. Well, we were in the middle of the reef between two islands when the whole of the western sky lit up. It seemed like it was afternoon, not nearly morning, not early morning. The color went from bright white to deep red and then a mixture of both with some yellow. We jumped behind big rocks on the reef and um, big rocks on the reef. We were too afraid to decide whether to run back to the small island or to run across the reef to the main island. It was Hiroshi, who was the boy that was with them, who finally pushed us to run to the main island. Just as we reached the last sandbank, the air around us split up, split open by an awful noise. I cannot describe what it was like. There was a man standing outside the first hut staring at the burning sky. A couple of us uh, ran into his hut where he um, ran onto his legs, um, threw ourselves onto his legs. The others ran into his hut where they threw themselves onto his wife who was trying to come outside to see what was happening. That afternoon, I found my hair was covered with white powder like substance. It had no smell and no taste when I tried tasting it. Nearly all the people on Ronalap became violently ill. Most, of, most had painful headaches and extreme nausea, nausea and diarrhea. By the time our evacuation to Kwajalein, all of the parts of my body that had been exposed that morning blistered and my hair began to fall out in clumps. I just had to run my fingers through it and they would come out full of dust. I mean, the kids were playing in the fallout before the people got sick. Yeah, they thought, they thought it was snow because they never saw it before. And when, and they like, when it snows, usually people stick their tongues in and stuff like that. So they're things. eating the radioactive fallout. Yeah. This is important. This is, and thank you for doing this. Roughly, where are you in your presentation in terms of I'm like almost done. Okay. So, 
After the testing, the Marshallese people have demonstrated concern about damage to their health and long-term implications to remove um, land, move other removals from their land and petition made in 1957, which I'm not going to read because we don't have time. But basically, um, William Lodge, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., asked the Secretary General to not introduce the petition to the U.N. until all tests were completed. The Secretary General agreed and took it took nearly four years for the U.N. to finally consider the position, and the U.S. government continued to speak for the Marshallese at the U.N., and the Marshallese people, and the result, were powerless to stop any more destruction to the island. So the U.N. killed it, too? Yeah. Why? What was the reason the U.N. did it? Well, I don't, they, they didn't know about it. Oh, my okay, God, the U.S. just didn't inform them. Yeah. Okay. So, because of the new, seven, 67 nuclear tests, the Marshall Islands has the highest rate of m cancer in the world. The people who had never seen snow thought that radioactive fallout oh, was snow because it was white and it fell from the sky. And the children stuck their tongues out to eat it. They ended up consuming it, causing them to either die or get very sick. Women and children were the most effective, effective especially pregnant women, because as I mentioned before, radiation caused deformities in babies and often, often caused the mothers to get sick. Not only did it affect the people, it also affected wildlife living in the area. Obviously, if radiation shows bad results when consumed by humans, it will also have the same effect on fish, if not, and other animals, if not worse results. The Marshallese people are connected to fish because it, because it is one of their important resources. However, due to radiation, consuming fish will get them sick. Um, also, although agent um, skills are now in decline, the Marshall pe Marshallese people and once able navigators using the stars and stick, shell, stick and shelf charts. Furthermore, women do not have the same rules as they did before and are not as equal as they were to men um, as they used to. So now men are the ha head of the household and hold more power than women do. And there was like an issue in the Marshall Islands. I don't know if it's still going on, but like there was a high rate of domestic violence. Now? Uh, I don't know. Like, I did a research project on that in, in fifth grade, but I know if it's still a problem. I really don't take it you know, that other kids are doing like, reports on like the habitats of raccoons and you're like domestic violence in a bunch of these islands in sixth grade. Okay. Um, lastly, after the introduction of radiation, the islands have very few natural resources that they are safer to rely on. As a result, exports from different countries exceed their imports and because of many test, it completely vaporized some islands and made, and many more forever uninhabitable. The situation has affected the tradition of passing down land because the most land is the most, the land most affected by nuclear testing is not usable anymore. And uh, passing down land is um, slowly dying because of climate change too, because of rising sea levels and coastal erosion. The end. Thank you.